The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Z Talk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. That was a play on a little bit of a homage to uh, my radio station boss and good friend uh, Scotty O'Rourke. Uh, he must have the most extensive uh, Ghost Hunter belt bottle collection I've ever seen. Anyway, that's the news, Scotty. Anyway, tonight our special guest will be Chris Rutkowski, uh, Canada's top ufologist, uh, commonly used by the uh, government, should we say, to verify claims. And uh, a good friend of mine from uh, Paracon Winnipeg 2013. Uh, we missed the first couple of minutes of the interview, unfortunately. So uh, I'm going to be jumping right in, uh, halfway through conversation with Chris. Um, but, you know, the, the phone calls from people uh, who had seen Charlie Red Star and other UFOs kept coming in to the astronomy department from people who said, you know, can you tell me what it was that I saw? and and I'm, you know, I, I don't understand it. Uh, what was it? And my astronomy professors, you know, they, because they went too crazy about it, they were a little bit annoyed at the phone calls and rolled their eyes as soon as the phone rang. Well, I thought this would be a perfect way to get on the good side of uh, my professors. So I, you know, courageously and valiantly and altruistically offered to take the uh, phone calls for them so that they wouldn't have to. And they said, uh, sure. So I found myself uh, uh, picking up the phones when the, they rang and started talking with people who had seen UFOs. Well, much to my surprise, the people weren't at all uh, uh, as crazy as I was led to believe. Certainly, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, about, about the same crazy level as uh, as myself and you and everybody else. Um, Ooh, but, that, okay, uh, that's scary. <laughs> But, uh, you know, they were simply seeing unusual objects in the sky. I didn't know what, uh, what exactly they had been seeing. Uh, some were certainly seeing stars and planets and aircraft and things like that. But I couldn't explain a certain percentage of uh, some of the reports. And those I sort of chalked up to, I have no idea. And uh, I learned very quickly that it was perfectly fine to say I have no idea because you don't have to uh, go out on a limb too much. But people continued to report things. And it was uh, a few years later uh, that I was actually uh, asked about what uh, I had been hearing from all the people I was speaking with uh, on the telephone. Uh, in addition to speaking with them on the phone, by the way, I took it upon myself to drive out uh, into the country to uh, you know, some of the rural areas and small towns to meet with the people who had seen things. So I had a better idea of you know, where they were pointing, how these things moved over the trees and so forth. So I was actually doing some serious investigations uh, and, you know, documenting them as best as I could. I published a few articles and I was interviewed by uh, local newspapers. And then one fateful day, um, uh, somebody in the physics department uh, had asked me if I would be interested in, you know, giving a presentation on what all these people said that they were seeing. Yeah. And I said, well, sure, I suppose I could. Um, being an undergraduate student, it was very, very unusual uh, to give a, a, a departmental seminar in physics. Um, so uh, I was a little bit nervous, but I agreed to do it. So I prepared my notes accordingly. And unfortunately, what happened was that word got around that this fellow named Chris Rutkowski was actually going to be talking in, about UFOs and giving a presentation at the University of Manitoba. And uh, it got so big, and uh, as a matter of fact, that uh, 
there were upwards of three or four hundred people who had shown up to hear me, so they had to move it into the largest lecture room in the entire university. Uh, people actually standing room only, packed to the to the gills, so to speak. And I gave my presentations, and I was you know was very well received and uh, very well reviewed. Um, and I became the local expert, at least in uh, in UFOs, and even more reports started coming my way. Yeah, actually, I actually have a chance to look at your video today. Uh, you said you hadn't actually seen that video before, or hadn't seen it uh, produced. Uh, you worked with uh, Jeff Didman and uh, Stephen Friedman. Uh, those guys are uh, legends. They, uh, legends in in the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, along the way, like I guess I met Stan Friedman early on. I think he came to the university in about 1976 or or so. Yeah. Um, about the same year that uh, uh, J. Allen Hynek, who was uh, sort of the grandfather of UFOs, uh, also came to the university. Yeah. Um, but I met uh, Stan back in the, in the, the 70s, and we, we hit it off fairly well. And uh, he ended up actually staying at my uh, my home when he had uh, come to Winnipeg that first time to give a presentation. And uh, we've kept in touch ever since. Uh, corresponded, we've appeared together on stage uh, quite a few times. Uh, so you know, I I you know really did uh, learn at the feet of some of the uh, the true uh, uh, pioneers in uh, ufology and astronomy because uh, J. Allen Hynek was of course a, a very famous astronomer in his own right as well. Um, and uh, you know that we we're talking back in the seventies still. Well, something interesting happened back in the seventies too, and I remember that um, uh, as these sightings were occurring back in the mid nineteen seventies. Um, I was, uh, uh, I remember interviewing a, a family that had seen a series of UFOs uh, uh, a little bit north of Carmen. And uh, uh, just off chance, they had said that they had had, a, you know, some other odd experiences as well. And uh, I inquired what that was. And they said, well, you know, there was a Sasquatch scene on our property uh, uh, just about a, a mile away from where the UFO was seen. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's that's a, a bit on the odd side, um, and uh, so I, I, you know, investigated that report as well. And then somebody had heard that I was investigating Sasquatch reports, and they started telling me about other Sasquatch reports. And I realized, well, it's a scientific curiosity too. So I started embracing <laughs> uh, the possibility of doing that uh, investigation as well. And then almost at the same time, um, one of the Sasquatch investigators. Uh, who was working in, in Manitoba at the time, uh, was telling me about some uh, uh, unusual phenomena that were occurring on uh, some of the uh, uh, First Nations reserves where luminous phenomena were being seen moving overhead uh, the same night or nights that some uh, uh, Sasquatch and, uh, and unusual uh, creatures were, were being reported. Uh, so, so do you think this is sort of con there. collaboration between... Uh, uh, Sasquatch. Sasquatch and uh, UFOs. The UFOs. And UFOs. But, but also, what happens is that some of the lights that were being seen uh, in some of these areas, and actually there was a place uh, just southeast of Winnipeg, where uh, spook lights were being observed. And uh, these were lights that were, you know, were, were they UFOs? Because they were lights that were moving around and people couldn't explain them. But the stories associated with these lights were that, um, in, in one particular case, down a railroad track where uh, a fellow had uh, gotten a little too drunk uh, late at night uh, one time and was walking home along the railroad track because it was the right of way. And he got so tired he laid down on the railroad track just to have a little bit of a nap and didn't count on the train coming by. Yeah. And he was decapitated. And apparently the story was that the uh, lights that were being seen move, moving up and down the railroad tracks late at night uh, were actually uh, this fellow, uh, his, his ghost, um, looking for his head, holding a lantern, walking up and down the area. Oh, really? So we, so we had a combination of uh, UFOs and Sasquatch and uh, ghosts and paranormal phenomena. There was a whole series of people were water witching, people were uh, you know doing some dowsing, people were um, hearing uh, uh, you know uh, sounds in the night. There were poltergeists. There was everything you can possibly imagine. Uh, so I, you know, began investigating and studying all of the types of phenomena, 
And I'm sure your listeners are familiar with the term Fortean phenomena, yeah. uh, yeah. where uh, Charles Fort, of course, was the documenter of all these types of things. And, uh, you know, we embrace them now under the general heading of paranormal phenomena. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they're uh, rightly uh, uh, Fortean phenomena. And uh, it, it was, there was just so much material, it was, it was very difficult to keep track. Uh, and so as the years progressed um, into the 80s, um, I did join forces with a few other people uh, who had been interested. Roy Bauer was studying the, the psychic phenomena to a great degree. There was a fellow named Bill Barodi. Yeah, he actually uh, worked with uh, uh, Mr. Vike as well. Which is kind of uh, yeah, well, that came along much, much later. Yeah, much, oh, okay. much later. Um, the uh, uh, like these individuals that I was working with in the 80s, uh, you know, we formed something called the Manitoba Mysteries Group. Uh, we got a lot of publicity. This was just about the same time as Ghostbusters yeah. uh, came out, and uh, boy, we really got a, a lot of attention. In fact, we, had, we got our own phone line, and uh, you know, every day uh, the answer machine would literally fill up with people reporting things, and, and uh, you know, whether it was a ghost or a Sasquatch or UFO, it was. It was really quite phenomenal uh, uh, how many uh, calls we were getting, and it was just a little, little overwhelming. Um, and the group disbanded after a few years, and so by the mid 1980s or so, towards the end of the 1980s, I was really focusing more on just the UFOs because uh, there were just far too many uh, cases for me to handle, and the other individuals were taking care of the, the psychic cases, the Sasquatch cases, and so forth. I was also studying, uh, I or had reported to me. Uh, lake monsters. Uh, I know that out your way you have uh, um, Ogopogo. Uh, Ogopogo. Uh, well, yeah. We're here in, in Manitoba, we have Manipogo, <laughs> and actually a second one called uh, Winnipego, oh, right. and a number of different lakes. And I, uh, you know, had been speaking with many master anglers who swore that they had seen these things uh, all over the uh, in various uh, uh, lakes in Manitoba. It's very fascinating, you know, the diversity of the, the strange phenomena. We are now getting into uh, the uh, cryptozoology. Uh, cryptozoology, yeah. Right. Cryptozoology, yeah. Which it is, turns uh, out that yeah. It turns out that the uh, there had been a professor uh, McLeod at the University of Manitoba, uh, who in the 1960s, I think, he was head of zoology, and he was actually uh, he actually launched an expedition to look for um, Manitoba. Uh, a very scientific uh, expedition, and uh, you know that was one of the first scientific expeditions uh, to uh, look for cryptids uh, ever in North America. So you know, the Manitoba has this rich history uh, of all, all these types of phenomena. But around the, in the late 1980s, uh, focusing more on the UFOs, uh, uh, as it was, we were getting around a couple of hundred cases in Manitoba alone. Yeah. Uh, during the, the Carmen uh, flap, and they had died down a little bit, but they were still quite significant. So, in the late 1980s, uh, I realized there was no, you know, central repository for documenting all the cases in Canada. I mean, I, I knew how many cases there were in Manitoba, but what about, you know, Alberta or BC or Ontario? And there really was no central location to to for people to report things to. So we had no idea how Manitoba was faring. So I got in touch with my colleagues, my, my uh, you know, the people uh, who are the, you know, doing similar work to me in other provinces. Yeah. And I appealed to them and I said, hey, you know, maybe we can work together to try and uh, collaborate and, uh, you know, contribute all the cases and I'll, I'll write them all up and, and do the statistics. And at this time, Jeff Dittman was, was still just starting into getting into it. Yeah. Uh, so, so we started doing, uh, we got a good response from... I guess about half of the uh, investigators in Canada, the other half were very proprietary and not my case. I'm not going to give you my, my information. That Forget doesn't about sound it. familiar or anything. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. So we did a little bit of that uh, and we started doing the analysis and uh, we started publishing our information, got, got published in a number of books and, uh, well, how uh, and books journals. How many books do you have, that, have out now? Uh, right now I have nine that. books out. Nine. Uh -huh. yeah. I thought it was yeah. eleven. Oh, but there you go. Pardon me. I thought it was eleven, but there you go. Yeah, well, nine. you know, you can always add a few more. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> you got a few um, more years, right? Right. Well, actually, the first book that that was published came in uh, came around the the mid uh, or early 1990s, and this was after uh, we were doing our analysis of the UFOs. Um, 
And, you know, people said, why don't you write all about this? So I, I actually, my first book was all about all the strange phenomena in Manitoba. We included a chapter of, uh, specifically on the data. Um, and uh, because we were doing an analysis of it all across Canada, we started, you know, really getting a, a lot of uh, cases, you know, from Ontario and BC and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually people started coming around and realizing that that uh, our work was actually quite diverse. We were giving everybody credit where credit was due. And more and more people started coming on board. And it was in about nine, or 2002, 2001, something like that, where a fellow named Brian Vike had started to... Uh, uh, you know, making, a, uh, you know, doing a few preliminary investigations into UFOs. And I was reasonably impressed with uh, his work. Uh, so we started corresponding and uh, he started sending some cases back and forth and I uh, was referring uh, cases to him. And uh, so when this film uh, that you were mentioning, this Magnificent obs Obsessions, uh, wanted to document my investigations across Canada, uh, we actually uh, went literally from uh, coast to coast. Yeah, I noticed uh, that. I, we started in uh, in BC uh, and uh, they Smithers flew me, there, uh, wasn't it? Pardon me. Up in Smithers, wasn't it? Yeah, they they flew us all the way up to Smithers, um, and uh, we actually got uh, 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 clouded in, and the weather was actually such that the plane couldn't take out uh, leave for uh, a full week. So we were stuck up there. <laughs> That's not surprising because um, they get some horrible weather up there. It's a lot of low cloud and rain and snow and. Yeah, well, actually, the clouds were you know below the peaks, and you know the pilot couldn't navigate between the peaks without uh, seeing anything. So yeah, it was uh, it was a little tricky. But they flew me from there all the way to uh, New Brunswick, where I uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, was, was you know conversing with Stan Friedman and investigating some cases back there. And uh, you know, it really was quite an interesting experience. So if people have a chance to uh, to see that uh, uh, that uh, show. Uh, it's uh, it's quite interesting. It's sort of a, a biography of a UFO investigator. Where, where uh, at that? least uh, at least it was in the mid two uh, thousands. Where did you find that show, Glenn? On YouTube? Yeah, it was on YouTube. Actually, yeah, Chris sent me the show today. Yeah. Yes, uh, somebody uh, had posted it on YouTube and converted it because it was uh, it was put onto a VHS and uh, somehow somebody had the ability to convert it from VHS into uh, a yeah, story yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what's, it's called, uh, what was it again? Um, it's, it's Magnificent Obsessions. Obsessions. It was actually yeah, a, right, series yeah. Of, yeah. a series of shows, and they w wanted to focus people uh, on people who were doing, you know, devoting a lot of time to particular uh, passions and, and uh, pastimes. So it's on and YouTube, so if any of our listeners want to go and... Uh, check it, it out. Check you it can out. actually check out my Facebook page, or you can go to... Uh, uh, ZetoReader.com, and I'll have the link up there. Uh, actually, I want to ask you a quick question, uh, reference uh, Jeff Didman. Uh, are you still collaborating with Jeff, or is that? Oh yeah, Jeff and I still work. We, we work every year on the uh, on the uh, annual Canadian UFO survey. Oh cool. Um, he's a stats guy, so he can uh, crunch them real good. Um, um, I do most of the entering of the UFO data. Yeah. Uh, which is very, very, and I will emphasize very, very, and add a couple more very, varies, uh, time-consuming and laborious. Uh, it takes approximately three months to enter uh, one year's worth of uh, UFO data. So you're oh, telling wow. me that's your summer vacation when you're not at uh, uh, teaching classes? Well, if, if, it was, if it was summer, it would be great, but you see what happens is we do it annually, so we wait until the end of December, and then we add another month because, you know, sightings kind of trickle in. People are a little bit slow about sending cases into us and, and so forth. So I actually don't, can't even start working on a year until about February, sometimes not even into March. Okay. And uh, so you then you count three months from there. But, of course, because it's, it's uh, you know, the springtime and we're actually very busy. Yeah. It takes a long, long time to enter all the data. Well, if somebody wanted to go find that data, where would they go to find it? Well, uh, we actually put the data um, into a, uh, uh, a database and a spreadsheet, which Jeff makes available online. And people can go to survey.canadianuforeport.com. That's survey.canadianuforeport, all one word, Dot com, 
um, uh, no W's or anything like that. And uh, there's a, a link there uh, that click on to go to data. Uh, and the data tables are all there. And I think um, they go back all the way to 1989. There's a couple of years which are missing because uh, of a couple of things. One is that um, uh, at one year we, we uh, lost the data when a hard drive crashed. Oh, that doesn't happen very often, does it? Exactly. Yeah. And, and then, of course, the, the thing that says save, yeah. backup. Yeah. <laughs> we forget to do, especially yeah. way back in this thing. Yep. Yeah. So there, there's, there's that that happened. And then the other thing is that uh, since 1989, computer formats have changed. Yes, they have and, from uh, 32 uh, to NTFS. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, even the floppy disks that we were using back then. Three and a half, uh, yeah. You know, most computers don't use, and the, the programs themselves, at that one time we were using Fortran, and then we yeah. were using DBase, and yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff, and most of those programs don't exist, and the formatting simply doesn't exist. So it's actually very time consuming to convert some of that, but he's managed to convert a, a good chunk of it. So I think we're almost uh, done. I think there's maybe two years worth, uh, which is, uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about the order of five or 600 reports, which is quite significant. Yes, it is. Um, to get a complete run so that once the 2013 cases are done, uh, probably by well, definitely by this time next year, uh, we'll have 25 years of UFO data for Canada, which is unique. Um, there's it's no uh, other country quite staggering, world. actually, 25 there's years. No, yeah, there's, there's no other country in the world that has undertaken this project, uh, certainly not in the United States. This data is simply not available. Yeah. Um, and uh, no other country, uh, there's actually... A, we, um, uh, I think it's Sweden and perhaps Spain have, uh, and maybe France to a certain extent, uh, have slightly similar uh, databases, but uh, certainly not uh, not as long as ours. So, uh, and you know, the reason we were doing this was to uh, provide the data because uh, when I was giving my presentations to scientists, yeah, they were saying things like, "Well, you know, there's there's no reliable UFO data, or pilots don't see UFOs." And uh, well, that's a bunch of caca. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, I said, "Well, where do you get your information from?" And they, you know, they would say, "Well, I mean, it's just common knowledge." I said, "Well, you actually have to look at the data in order to make such statements." Yeah. Um, so what we're doing is that we're actually providing the data. So if a scientist wants to say that you know, 50% um, of all UFO cases are explainable as, uh, you know, optical illusions. Well, you take a look at the actual UFO data and you can see, you know, whether your hypothesis uh, is correct or not. Uh, they're not, but uh, uh, it does allow, you know, easy access for anyone uh, yeah. to, you know, to understand what people really are seeing. So, uh, so you know, there's all these, you know, you go onto the internet and there's so much crap on the internet. You know, people seeing, you know, massive UFOs and UFO invasion forces and aliens talking to us and all this sort of stuff. Well, you strip away all of that and the sightings that we are actually categorizing and entering into uh, the computer databases are what people really are seeing. Yeah. And for the most part, they're not seeing uh, little gray guys or little green guys or little green women, or for that matter. Um, they're they're seeing lights in the sky, and you know a lot of them do turn out to be planes and stars and Chinese lanterns and whatnot. Yeah. So um, you know this is a good way of of really showing what people are seeing. And and the thing is that probably by the time 2013 is uh, data is in, we'll have somewhere around 15,000, maybe a little bit more. Um, UFO cases, and we know that somewhere around one or two or three percent are unexplained, like high quality un unknowns. So if you're looking at, you know, at a database of 15,000 and even one percent is 150 cases mm -hmm. uh, that are good cases and can't be explained, and let's say you got rid of you know, uh, half of those because of, you know, for one reason or another, um, you're still going to be looking of the order of, you know, 50, 75, 100 
good, interesting UFO cases, well witnessed, well described, with, you know, perhaps seen by pilots, perhaps seen by air traffic controllers, and maybe seen by two or three people at a time, and maybe there's ground markings, and maybe there's photographs, and so forth. So, you know, it's an interesting database because the sheer numbers will will force some uh, interesting results one way or another. And not, I don't think we'll stop at 25 years, but it, the 25 year perspective will be something that uh, will be very, very useful for people to, to take a look at. Okay, from a purely uh, Canadian perspective, as you will, uh, what's your thoughts on Roswell and Area 51? Well, it, it's it's interesting that you asked me about that because um, a year and a half ago, I was asked by Kevin Randall, who is regarded as one of the world's leading authorities on uh, on Roswell, to be part of the so-called Dream Team, um, and the idea is that he would assemble a, a group of uh, experts and uh, individuals uh, and researchers uh, to um, assess the entire you know, all, all the information there is available on Roswell and uh, to see what, you know, whether there's anything really interesting in there and uh, uh, anything worthwhile studying. Um, and it's ongoing, um, so uh, you know, there aren't any final results yet. I've looked at, you know, other, there's been some interviews with, uh, uh, you know, uh, pers Army personnel and Air Force personnel. Uh, uh, who attest one, you know, one way or another that you know they saw creatures or they saw something occurring at a certain time, and, and somebody's held a piece of uh, material that has uh, you know um, unbent itself once you crumpled it in your hand and things like that. Uh, and we try to assess the reliability and the authenticity of some of these statements. And um, there's some statements going around that maybe there's additional pieces that could be found at the site. There's a, another. There's been already been archaeological digs at the site, there probably will be another one coming up fairly soon. Um, uh, but, you know, so I, I'm approaching this as the way I would any other UFO case, even though Roswell is technically not a UFO case, um, that uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll analyze uh, the data and uh, study it as objectively as possible. Um, having said that, um, I would suspect that at this late date, you know, it would be very difficult to get any definitive information because uh, all the you know, people who were, you know, intimately involved uh, firsthand back in 1947 uh, are dead. Uh, most of their children are are passed on as well, yeah. um, let alone their spouses. Uh, so, uh, you know, getting some, some proof uh, firsthand is, is impossible. Yeah. Um, there are a few cases of some deathbed testimonies which have come out recently uh, by uh, Air Force and, Air, and Army personnel who say, yeah, 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 it really happened, uh, but I couldn't say anything while I was alive, and you know, and then they pass on. Um, so, you know, there's things like that that are coming forth. The other possibility is that if there really had been something uh, at the time uh, of really great significance, let's say aliens really did crash in Roswell, uh, it would be so successfully deep-sixed in terms of covering up that yeah. there wouldn't be any documents available. You'd, you'd never get to see anything resembling a document that says, you know, yeah, we transferred the flying saucer from this army base to that army base. That would simply not exist. Um, so I would be very, very suspicious of, uh, of documents coming to light that, that prove this one way or another. Um, the other thing is that as an astronomer, you know, uh, uh, I would find it very difficult to, to believe that uh, a crashed flying saucer wouldn't have been reverse engineered in one way or another. I know Volkswagen had a um, had a commercial for a while saying, saying that the new Beetle was reverse engineered from a flying saucer. Yeah. Um, and supposedly things like Velcro and uh, transistors uh, were developed because they had studied flying saucer, the crash bits of flying saucers from 1947. Uh, unfortunately, uh, transistors were uh, well underway by the time 1947 rolled around, so that doesn't, doesn't work at all. Um, and, you know, simple question, why would we spend a billion dollars on a rocket to go to the moon if we had parts of a flying saucer? 
um, that we were trying to reverse engineer. It just, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, and again, so having said all that though, uh, uh, the question is what happened at Roswell? And I don't think there is any definitive explanation at this point. There's some interesting stories about um, uh, uh, that perhaps it was a, a Operation Paperclip gone mad. Paperclip, of course, was the uh, uh, American project which uh, spirited away uh, Nazi scientists working on the V-2 rocket uh, from Germany and put them in the middle of the desert uh, in, in the nearby Roswell. Uh, to try and manufacture our own, our Americans' own rockets. Uh, and that was well underway at the time. And there's some suggestion that perhaps, you know, they were doing some experiments, uh, you know, uh, launching some rockets and things like that. And yeah. something might have gone terribly well, awry. Well, you have so to there's think that type of thing. Yeah, you have to think of the time, too. It's 1947. You know, a rocket really at that point in time would not, would be very abnormal. Yeah, well, look, the uh, V1, V2 uh, rocket technology from the German standpoint, which was uh, miles ahead, miles ahead of, of uh, anybody else who had any sort of rocket technology, which was insane. Yeah. Right. And, of course, uh, Operation Paperclip occurred or was was underway at precisely where, um, you know, the uh, crashed flying saucer was supposed to have happened uh, nearby Roswell. So it's interesting that the two are concurrent. and. I suspect that the two are related in some yeah. way, but I, I couldn't begin to imagine how exactly. Well, you'd never see the paperwork on that because the U.S. government and the U.S. military, like a lot of militaries in the world, there's a, definitely another side to them that, you know, that the paperwork suddenly stops and you don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, there. I mean, the way that the military um, machine worked, I mean, there would have been some some paperwork involved, but whether that would ever see the light of day. Uh, in an archive or not is uh, is very very unlikely. Nevertheless, um, I mean we know about um, uh, the Manhattan Project, which yeah. went on for you know literally under the noses of uh, an entire university campus. In fact, uh, there's some great stories, unfortunate stories, about, about how the football players at the university were actually asked to. Um, to, you know, to to do some of the heavy lifting of these uh, very very heavy lead containers, without knowing that they're actually you know carrying the bomb. <laughs> that was way uh, back in the Oppen Oppenheimer days, where yeah, uh, yeah, the good old days. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so uh, you know, there, you know, and we didn't find out the details of the Manhattan Project until much much later. So yeah. secrets can be kept. Um, and, uh, you know, you, one could argue that the, uh, you know, aliens, uh, you know, actually being on this planet would be probably one of the top secrets ever imaginable. And that's Stanton Friedman's viewpoint, too, is that, you know, this, this is it. This is the whole ball game. Uh, it could, you know, the, the revelation that aliens are here changes everything. Politics, uh, the economy, religion, you name it. So, uh, you know, uh, one would imagine that this would, you know, tend to be uh, clamped down pretty good. Well, what we have is uh, uh, flights flying into uh, Area 51 on a regular basis. Uh, definitely, obviously, there's going to be staff flights, uh, people who work on the base and whatever. Uh, but those are kind of kept off the books. Uh, is there a reason? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, Area 51 and certainly other locations. Here in Canada, we have Cold Lake. Yeah. And uh, there's at least uh, one other location, uh, which is uh, completely verboten. Uh, there's a lot of suggestion uh, that what's going on uh, in these uh, locations are, are testing of uh, very superior technology. We do know that the stealth fighters uh, came out of uh, Area 51, were being tested there, the B-1 bomber, and and so forth. So the uh, uh, there's a, a long history of uh, you know aeronautical achievements, so the what's the lights that are you know rising straight up over the mountains and zipping off, probably uh, you know uh, the uh, the technology that is currently under under development uh, by American uh, scientists. So you know uh, one can say that you know maybe they're alien or not, but I, I you know given that you know we know that uh, other uh, secret weapons were developed out there, it seems reasonable to suggest that that's where those things are uh, are coming from too. Yeah. I mean, we do. We also know on here, you know, speaking of secret aircraft, 
and most people have heard of uh, uh, the U2 uh, crash uh, in uh, in Russia, uh, where Francis Gary Powers, uh, you know, was uh, uh, taken into custody uh, yeah. by the Soviets, and uh, you know, the whole uh, secret uh, U2 uh, uh, reconnaissance program was in jeopardy, and they you know, they thought it was incredible that a, an aircraft like that could. Uh, crash in the uh, in, uh, Soviet Union, and you know that's where all the information comes from. Well, most people don't, you know, don't are, are not aware that uh, there was a U-2 crash in Saskatchewan um, uh, just before Francis Gary Powers, and it actually wasn't a, a hard crash. They actually came in for a, a landing, and because uh, it had some technical problems, it was actually. Uh, uh, responded to by RCMP from uh, Manitoba from Flin Flon. There's actually photographs on the internet of the U-2 plane um, uh, in Saskatchewan in the middle of winter on a frozen lake. Uh, and uh, you know, so the the U-2 uh, you know, people don't realize that the U-2 problem was was something that was a, a very serious issue, and that Canada played a very important role in it as well. Hmm. I didn't know that that. That's interesting because that you know that is not something you've ever heard of in any of our history books or even with the media at that you know at that time people would have known. Yeah, and and you know we've gone on uh, to uh, uh, find UFO documents too in government files, and uh, I found one uh, just a, a year or two ago um, of uh, about an incident that occurred in 1960, um, not far from there actually. Um, in northern Saskatchewan, uh, actually, sorry, north of uh, the border of Saskatchewan uh, and uh, the Northwest Territories, where a um, hunter had been dropped off uh, by a float plane, and they were going to pick him up in another week or something like that. Uh, and uh, as soon as the float plane left, uh, he was starting to make camp, and uh, he heard a whistling sound, and he, he looked and saw uh, an object that was spinning like a top, uh, fall into uh, uh, the lake, not very far from where he was, and it was as it was spinning, it was it had spokes sticking out and, and everything, and it, it was throwing out water in all directions, and eventually stopped spinning and settled below the surface of the lake. And uh, he, you know, got his canoe and paddled over there and poked at, at you know, tried to find it under the water and found this big depression uh, in the mud under uh, the water, but couldn't find anything. When he got back to civilization, he dutifully informed the RCMP, who told the uh, Canadian Air Force, uh, which dispatched another plane, and a whole bunch of people went out there and poked and prodded un underneath the uh, the water, and they couldn't find anything. It was reported to the National Research Council. Uh, it was uh, investigated over a period of a uh, couple of years. They said uh, they were going to send a magnetometer over there to try and find the metallic particles. And eventually, they, they just simply gave up. They stopped looking for whatever it was under the water. Uh, now that's a bit odd because uh, you know uh, usually what happens if, if a satellite falls down to Earth or a piece of something falls down to Earth, uh, the American government moves mountains to try and find out whatever it was. I mean, when Cosmos 954 uh, fell into the Northwest Territories, that was a, a major incident. And, uh, you know, it, they, they mobilized hundreds of personnel to try and retrieve this and picked up, you know, not only the bigger chunks that were the size of a car, but picked up uh, particles smaller than the head of a pin um, because of, a, a, you know, a, uh, some perceived danger to uh, of radiation. Now, in 1960, we didn't have that problem, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, something fell into, uh, you know, a remote part of the Northwest Territories in Canada and uh, nothing was done about it as far as we know whatever fell from the sky is still there and whether it was an alien spacecraft or a piece of a russian satellite or even if it was american satellite for gosh sakes in 1960 that still would have been significant it's still up there yeah uh, and the, the documents prove that whatever happened is still up there it's probably way back in the apollo missions i guess yeah so but you know you, you don't know too what might have happened in secret, yeah, they might have just said, oh, yeah, we tried and we gave up, but they might have gotten it and didn't want anyone to know about it, too. Yeah, and of course, there's another, this might sound familiar to some of your listeners, the Shag Harbor case of 1967, where something fell into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of uh, Nova Scotia, 
and uh, uh, was witnessed by RCMP officers and many, many people on land uh, who had seen this, this fireball or, or something flying over the, the land and then fall into the ocean uh, not far offshore. And the RCMP um, uh, quickly um, enlisted the help of some fishermen and their boats to get out to where this thing had gone. And uh, they, when they got to the spot on the ocean, there was a bright luminous green foam and a big circle uh, where this thing had gone down. And eventually the, the luminosity decreased and went out. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of people saw this. And uh, the stories are that uh, the United States Navy had sent divers in um, to try and retrieve whatever it was. And they did take out something under the water. So there was a submarine retrieval operation and there's a story that some people had seen something being loaded onto a, a flatbed trailer from a dock uh, onto a military transport and uh, being taken away. So, you know, there there are things that uh, do fall from the sky, and it's quite interesting that, you know, the documentation shows that something is definitely out there, but things come down here too. Uh, we took a look at the uh, close encounters of the third kind. Uh, which was a classic movie. Myself and Janessa were just up in Wyoming at Devil's Tower. So mm -hmm. We stood there in front of the thing. The place is huge. It's like yeah. 15,000 or... 5,000... 5, 1,500 and... No, 5,135. <laughs> yeah, correct. Uh, she got it. Yeah. Anyway, but just to stand there and be below it is interesting at best. Uh, what's the theory on planes and boats being dropped in the Gobi Desert? <laughs> well, of course that that was uh, uh, that was pretty fanciful. I mean, uh, there there's one case that sort of um, is related to that. That there was a uh, some planes that were found um, that uh, were supposedly lost in the Bermuda Triangle, and the planes were later found uh, um, on an island somewhere. Um, so that that's you know that's the fictional part. Uh, planes do get lost uh, uh, in that, that particular area, uh, so that you know it's it, that the, the boats being dropped in the Gobi de Desert. No, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> just checking because I saw it on TV, and you know, oh, yeah, you do one that. of those things. Yeah, you never know. You have to check on those things. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't quite sure how much of it was actually based on fact, how, how much well, it was based it's on Hollywood. Well, interesting that a lot of the people uh, who were depicted, uh, like the uh, the character of the French investigator, is based on a fellow named Jacques Vallée, yeah. um, who's one of the key uh, players in the ufology. He's uh, getting quite old now, but uh, his books are still uh, considered uh, some of the, the basis for most of ufology. And uh, um, at, towards the end of the movie, uh, where the aliens are coming out of the ship and they're meeting everybody. Um, there's a, an elderly fellow with a pipe and glasses and a beard uh, kneeling down as the creatures come up to him. And uh, that fellow is Joseph Allen Hynek, who was my friend. And he, they actually allowed him to have a cameo in the movie. Uh, and he te he's told some interesting stories about uh, the filming of that. So, it, And a lot of the cases that they did depict, uh, like the chase... Um, of the police cars uh, around the mountainsides and that type of thing. Those are taken directly from some of the cases that uh, J. Allen Hynek himself investigated. So yeah. a lot of what's in there uh, does come from, from that. The other thing it does depict is the, the uh, intensity with which people who see UFOs uh, uh, and ex have experiences uh, you know, really hold on to their beliefs very, very strongly and it can change their lives very, very dramatically. You know, some people uh, you know, literally, uh, you know, have personality changes, and it really does have a profound effect on on who they are. So, uh, th it does depict that as well. Okay, uh, actually, Chris, I have to quickly go to a commercial break. You know, we've got about five minutes, so if you want to go take a poo break and do whatever you need to do, this is your time to do it. So we'll be right back after these messages. I'm Sarah. I'm Ellen. One night, I was at a bar. One night, I was at a bar. I had one too many drinks. I had one too many drinks. I got behind the wheel. I got a cab. A squirrel ran across the road. A squirrel ran across the road. I swerved. The cab swerved. I hit a guy. The cabbie just missed a guy. I wish I took a cab. Thank goodness I took a cab. You have the choice to save a life. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the Department of Transportation and the Ad Council.
Have you ever been curious as to why paranormal investigators, ufologists, cryptozoologists, and demonologists do what they do? Check out Canadian X Talk Radio, Saturday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, on ZTalkRadio.com. The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of ZTalk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Believe in ghosts? Do you think Bigfoot is real? Do you suspect that your neighbor is really Val Tor, leader of the lizard people of Bendar 3? Well, Dr. Dim doesn't, and he'll tell you why when you tune in to Dimland Radio Saturday nights, 11 Central, midnight Eastern on Z Talk Radio Network. It's an hour of science promotion, pop culture rants, personal observation, and of course, skepticism. Dr. Dim might even have a guest or two. Join Jim, Dr. Dim Fitzsimmons, Saturday nights, 11 Central, midnight Eastern, for Dimland Radio on Z Talk Radio Network. Okay, welcome yeah. back to Canadian X Talk Radio. My name is Glenn Ferguson, joined as always by my wife Janessa. Our special guest tonight is Chris Brutkowski. Uh, it took me a while to figure out his name because uh, I did it a few times. I actually recruited uh, Mr. Brutkowski. 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 See, I, I still can't say it. <laughs> but uh, to give me a hand with uh, my interview at uh, the Marlboro Hotel in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, he was amazing, as always. I played the well, awesome host. The camera work was what was amazing. Yeah, well, that was How about a combination in, in, in of the, the both background. of you, right? Yeah, yeah okay, whatever. Anyway. And, and Grace was amazing, too. Grace was definitely amazing. She gave me a shitload of history 
that I didn't know about, and I give her a shitload of history back that she didn't mm -hmm. know about. So it was kind of well, a nice uh, trade-off. One of the things that and we've been talking about UFOs all this time, uh, of course, my uh, research and investigations into paranormal, yeah. excuse me, uh, psychic phenomena, uh, uh, was you know has was also you know um, quite a, an important part of the development of my research ability as well, because I went on many uh, expeditions into uh, supposedly haunted locations. Uh, uh, you know, uh, because we had gone public at one time that you know, we uh, were sought out by uh, the general public to come into their private homes. Um, so we spent a lot of time in, uh, in locations that were supposedly haunted or had some you know, paranormal phenomena going on. Um, there was a uh, place called the uh, Mother Tucker's Restaurant, which is an old Masonic temple. And uh, there were a lot of very unusual phenomena going on in there. Um, uh, the uh, is a restaurant, and uh, the cooks uh, were saying that you know many times the lights would be going on and off. Yeah. Um, the managers were talking about how that they, you know they would set up. You know after everyone had gone, uh, they made a point of setting all the tables, putting the napkins, you know, just perfectly uh, on all the place settings, and uh, making sure the cutlery was done, and then leaving. This was probably about two or three in the morning. And when people came in uh, for uh, for the lunchtime to set up at about uh, nine or ten o'clock the following morning, uh, the napkins were all on the floor, <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, things like that. So there, uh, and there was actually a coffin or two coffins that were found. I found one of them. Uh, one was on the, the roof, and one was inside a, uh, of the wall. Uh, there was a hole in, in one of the walls, and a small child's coffin was in there. Um, it was, you know, there are a lot of very strange things. There's, uh, there's actually a staircase that leads up to a blank wall. Uh, there's another staircase that leads up to um, a, a wooden door. And a number of people had said that they had uh, heard footsteps um, uh, coming uh, down the stairs from the other side. And they saw the knob turn and then nothing happened. And of course, they opened the door and, and uh, there was no one there. So <laughs> there's a whole series of things that happened there. So, you know, the investigations were uh, quite intense and uh, it was uh, quite fascinating to experience uh, that whole side of the paranormal phenomenon as well. Actually, for me, uh, to go down to the press club and actually spend some time down there in the dark at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning was kind of interesting. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know I've spent lots of time uh, in places. I've gone to seances in a number of places where... Uh, uh, you know, people have been trying to channel uh, uh, people through. Um, I've been into uh, Lower Fort Gary here in Manitoba, where uh, people had sworn that they had, you know, uh, heard chains rattling and uh, you know, people wailing and, and things like that. So there's uh, quite a few different types of, of phenomena that, that have been reported. I was uh, called in to help exercise a, a house uh, that was having some uh, some problems. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's, it's interesting that all the types of phenomena are very personal, humanistic uh, experiences. So um, it, it suggests that uh, what paranormal investigators are doing is really um, important psychologically uh, for the witnesses themselves. People are simply asking and uh, appealing to uh, paranormal investigators for help, saying that we, you know, we, we need your help in trying to understand what these experiences are and and uh, we really do need uh, some interpretation in order for us to carry on with our lives. Yeah. We're going to try and add Derek right now. Let's see if okay. we can get him on. Looks like he's gone online. Hello? Yeah, yeah. You, are we there? Yeah, we've got a kind of a miscommunication here. Uh, we're mm. actually trying to get a hold of Derek uh, to add him to the conversation which is kind of nice because he's got a nice native perspective to uh, mm -hmm. what we deal with uh, within the paranormal. Uh, well, and, uh, you know, we were working closely here in Manitoba as well yeah. with the uh, First Nations people. Um, there's uh, uh, a number of individuals who had experienced the shaking tent uh, rituals, and there was uh, a ritual that's done when uh, you know information is being sought, so uh, you know it was uh, involved with individuals doing that. Plus, there's also petroforms throughout Manitoba 
uh, some sacred sites, uh, that some of which are affiliated with some luminous phenomena. That was very interesting to explore uh, as well. So, you know, there is a, a washover for all these types of phenomena, and uh, it all really does build upon one another. Yeah. Just f trying to figure out what phone Derek's on here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that sounds that sounds like a paranormal phenomenon all to itself. Yeah, that is, isn't it, Mr. White Sky Cloud? Not available. Not available. Oh uh, well. We know he's online. I just don't know which one he's on. Oh well. We'll keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, with your dealings, do you find all these, um, you know, like Sasquatch or cryptozoology, um, paranormal? phenomena, ufology, they're all interconnected somehow? Well, I think, you know, there there was this one particular case I mentioned where there was a uh, Sasquatch seen um, not far away from uh, where a UFO was seen just, uh, you know, the same day. Uh, and uh, it turns out there were also some uh, paranormal phenomena seen in the same area, some, you know, some dowsing, some uh, people seeing some luminous lights bobbing over graveyards and, and that yeah. type of thing. So th there is a... a an interesting overlap. Now, whether that's because uh, the experiencers themselves, the people who are reporting these things, uh, you know, have a, a different perspective or a perception that's slightly different than ours, or there actually is a real connection, that's something that remains to be seen. We'd certainly need more data in order to, uh, to establish that. Yeah, I don't know, you know, I don't know if the data, you know, as you said, you know, you guys have about 25 years of data with the uh, Ufology. I don't know if there's a lot of data with paranormal phenomena, as there's no basically, one really shares it. And that's it. But basically, the problem is we're not sharing anything with any of the groups. We don't have a big researcher like yourself, or you know, you and your partner there, that is willing to sit down and put it all down and say, "Here's and and actually do the evidence." Well, that's true. Uh, although you know, um, the uh, the uh, the British or the Psychical Research uh, Society of London used to be the, the center for that. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it used to be that all the, uh, you know, the really important research was being published through them, and uh, they were kind of uh, supervising a lot of the work that was being done in Europe. Uh, and then the, Amer the American Psychical Research, uh, Psycho Research, Psychical Research Society um, uh, was doing a little bit of that too, the experiments with... Uh, uh, Joseph Ryan on ESP. Um, you know, we're going back into the 1950s there. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole series of things. There's an interesting paper, as a matter of fact, um, by, I can't remember his first name now. His last name is Bem. Is it uh, Reginald Bem? Uh, somebody Bem? Cornwallis Bem? Anyways, he did a, a, a meta analysis of. Uh, um, of uh, uh, yeah, psychic phenomenon and uh, ESP, and he found there actually was a positive effect, and the skeptics dumped all over him, said that he had done it incorrectly, and he's biased, and all this sort of stuff. Well, apparently there's another paper that's coming out, I think this month, or perhaps next month, or even in September, um, uh, of another analysis uh, following the same tracks, trying to, trying to duplicate his own findings, and uh, the word is that they have found a positive correlation, so that ESP really does exist. And you know, a, a lot of people take it for granted that it that it does, but scientifically there hasn't been anything to prove it. And and yet these studies are constantly going on. Uh, people are very diligent uh, in studying the phenomenon. Roy Bauer, who I worked with for many years, he performed tens of thousands of rolls of dice trying to influence uh, how they would turn out and reported some uh, astounding uh, 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 you know, results uh, in that there were uh, you know, some very positive results that were greatly above uh, significance. Uh, so people are doing, have been doing this all along. So it's true there is not you know, really anybody who's in charge of all the you know, psychic stuff all around, Canada, you know, all around the world, it's certainly not even just in Canada. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think it is ripe for, for someone to, to sort of amass all the information. But like you say, uh, getting yeah. people to share the information is, is well nigh impossible. But it's tough for us too, actually, as uh, paranormal investigators, that we have to go out there 
and uh, create a database uh, which people can feed off. But a lot of the time, the groups that are around us they don't really, really want to uh, take uh, any information from us. Yeah, or they say, or you get your naysayers that say, oh, you're just, and, you know, they just rip apart your, your evidence and, and they, they mm -hmm. haven't been there. Right, and of course everybody has different techniques too. I mean, everybody, I you know, probably, uh, I would imagine that the different groups aren't using the same equipment even. No. You know? And, uh, uh, you know, that's one thing that would be needed. If you all use the same equipment, uh, at least you'd be able to say, oh, you know, if somebody reported something in Pennsylvania using a specific type of meter uh, and it got a certain reading, you could say, oh, I got the exact same reading here in Vancouver when I was investigating this house, you know, and you'd be able to, to say, oh, these are, these two things are similar, but because uh, there's such a, a wide variety of equipment that are being used, not, not only the equipment is different, but the, the experience of the individuals doing it, the belief systems of the individuals doing it, it's a very, very difficult thing to quantify. And unfortunately, and until such uh, uh, quantification is available, then science is simply not going to accept any results by by ghost hunters or paranormal hunters, which is a, a problem uh, because, of course, you know the, the uh, you you want to be able to show some positive uh, results so that you know maybe you can get some funding, maybe you can present it to the scientific community, uh, and in doing so get more information available. So it's a very complex issue. Um, but it, I don't think it's insurmountable. I think there are ways of doing it, but you just have to, you know, do it in a very scientific and rigorous manner. And I, certainly the way that uh, that I observed Glenn uh, doing his work uh, when he was here in Winnipeg, if that's what you're doing when you're out in BC, then uh, you're well on the way to uh, to accomplishing that. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's sitting there going, oh, uh. <laughs> with my mouth open. Yeah, well, with his I'm mouth done. open. He just, you're, he, you're sort of doing it by the seat of your pants, is what you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, you know, he, when he goes into a location, he sits down and he researches it. You know, he wants yeah. to find out what he can about the location, and then take it with what the the client says and go back and just, you know, verify basically. Verify everything. So yeah. you're not, yeah, study, you know, study, study, study. Yeah. 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 You know, the the and idea the, is to it, make the 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 client. Uh, you know, calm down and feel at home in their own home, kind of, basically. That's true, yeah. Yeah, you know, we've had, you know, sometimes uh, activity associated with the land, sometimes it's associated with the house. Uh, you never know. Yeah, there's, there's so many different things that could happen. The other interesting thing, and this is a big difference between um, UFO research and, uh, let's say, a, a haunting, uh, is that uh, in terms of UFOs, not including abductions, but let's say just UFOs, you know, a person sees a UFO on a Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon and seen for five minutes, and then you know it's red in color and this sort of thing. You can you know talk to the witness, and um, you get all the information you can, and the thing's not not around anymore because it's zipped away or whatever. That's the extent of the case. In terms of a haunting. Well, it could be ongoing. Uh, you could spend literally months upon months upon months or years studying one particular haunting. Uh, in fact, there's some investigators who've written entire books about you know, things that have been going on in one particular house or building. Uh, so it's a completely different type of phenomenon in that it's, it's not as localized in time and space as, as a UFO report. Uh, and that, of course, that's one of the big problems with uh, scientifically studying it, you have to expend so much time and uh, and uh, energy uh, investigating one particular case. That uh, who's to say, you know, you're you might be in a particular location, you know, six nights out of a out of a week, and on the seventh night when you're not there, that's when something might happen. So well, they don't uh, perform on command, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's one of the big problems. Yeah, we we know that one. You know, you go in and. Your, your homeowner is saying, well, this happens, this happens, this happens, and you come out and nothing happens. And yeah. you know, That's why one of the things I, I tell uh, the homeowners or the witnesses to keep diaries themselves. Yeah. So that even if we're not there, at least, you know, they can say, well, you know, it was two nights ago at 10 o'clock at night that this thing happened. And, uh, 
and then uh, you know the following night uh, it didn't happen but the, the night after that it happened at 11 o'clock so you know you might be able to come up with some explanations based on that yeah. so actually in this case the uh, the witnesses themselves are the tools by which uh, paranormal and haunting investigators uh, can investigate a particular site uh, because you can't be there all the time well, the experiencers themselves can well, you know, on top of that, you know, it, a lot of it too is how much their stress levels are, because that's creating energy, and you know, the common the common theory is energy creates more activity. And I'm gonna go, and Glenn's gonna have to talk. Hello, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, actually, what Jessica was saying was pretty much right. And uh, What's that? Uh, your actual emotions uh, do create strong emotions Who's within this? an environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll have amazing. a pepperoni with extra sauce. Um, <laughs> Shut up. Hello, you listen to Canadian X Talk Radio, and my name is Dan Ferguson, joined by my wife Janessa. We're just going to a quick commercial break. <laughs> Hey, what up? Cooney M. Senior listening to Z Talk Radio Network on ztalkradio.com. expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Z Talk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Gaze into the face of fear. I'm not scared. Denial is to be expected in the face of pure evil. I'm a psycho. Oh, um, maybe you need a time out. Kids today, so desensitized by movies and television.
You're listening to Canadian X Talk Radio on the Z Talk Radio Network. Hello and welcome back to Canadian X Talk Radio. My name is Dan Ferguson, joined as always by my wife Janessa. We have some special guests tonight uh, Chris Rutkowski and uh, Derek Weisgart Lauer is joining us for the last portion of the evening. Derek, how's it going? I'm doing good, my friend. Haven't heard from you for a while. I have been very, very, very busy. Mm. It's going to get busier because we're working with uh, Paracon Vancouver 2014 next year. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'm looking forward to have this happening because I've got so many people that I, I've been sharing some information regarding it. And I said, what do you think? And they're going, let me be part of it. Well, we just got to get a venue. That's uh, I'm working on the venue right now. We want to go into Vancouver. You want Vancouver? Yeah. yeah. You sure you don't want Cloverdale? No. No. We thought about it, but, uh, you know, being in Vancouver, uh, being close to the spaghetti factory in there. Well, yeah, we need to do spaghetti factory. Well, right, yeah, and Blood right. Alley, so. Blood Alley. Yeah, so it's better to be in, you know, I'm looking at the agri- Agrodome. Uh, can't see why not. It'd be kind of cool actually get the comic book people involved, Comic Con. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, say how to Chris Rakowski. Hey, Barbecue Master. Hey there, Derek. How's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. Good, uh, good to hear from you again. Yeah, yeah, we're having lots of fun out here. And uh, well, here, everybody's actually. I, I stuck around for a couple more days in Winnipeg after we uh, finished the uh, Paracon. Oh yeah, yeah. I hung around the uh, Marble Hotel a little bit longer to see what we also would get there. For a couple of days. <laughs> My dog is barking in the background there. That's okay. That's your fourth guest. <laughs> yeah. But say, uh, do you have any questions, you guys? We haven't talked, and Derek hasn't talked to his uh, barbecue master for a while. We had a barbecue at uh, at the end of Paracon, and uh, Chris and Derek decided to be the barbecue masters. They, oh uh, yes, yeah. We were the we were the uh, grill masters, uh, you know, serving up uh, delectable delectable dishes for the uh, the eight masses. Uh, he was dropping the dogs and the burgers, and I was putting the sauces on. Yeah. Wasn't that the uh, paracondom thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I gotta send those to you. I gotta email those to you so you can get those that thing edited and put on the site. I can do that. Yeah, paracondoms. Paracondoms, the best protection uh, in our field. I yeah, guess. yeah. <laughs> Everybody can laugh now or later. Well, I, I have a, a pretty a professional uh, question to ask, Eric. Okay, go. I've been I've been doing some. Uh, uh, Sasquatch uh, investigations. We've had a rash of Sasquatch uh, reports here in uh, in Manitoba over the past month or so, and I've, I was asked to comment on them, and I've been talking to some people. There's actually a Sasquatch investigator who's uh, coming, uh, already booked for the next Paracon in Winnipeg next year. Uh, his name's Mike Barquette, and uh, uh, I just want to know uh, Derek's opinion on uh, the nature of Sasquatch uh, from a First Nations perspective. Well, the Sasquatch uh, was always considered as the brother um, to the, the powwow drum group. When our, for example, uh, a lot of people, at one time, <clears throat> it was illegal to play powwow drums because the government made it illegal. And so the Sasquatch took care of the uh, spirit drum, one of the grandmother's drums, the main one, and hid it away in the bush. And uh, until it was time, and then they decided to bring it forward again after the law was re uh, was released, and uh, where people were able to drum again, and uh, uh, that was back in eighty two, nineteen eighty two. Okay. okay. Or that was, it was like I said before, it was illegal. Um, <clears throat> but uh, having to have, we got a lot of Sasquatch out here in BC. Yeah. 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 And um, I've, I've experienced, uh, a friend of mine actually had, had uh, he's experienced five or six Sasquatches all in one family, uh, where they actually picked up his truck, his Jeep, and put it on top of a big, huge rock, and they wouldn't go anywhere. Good and word. Were, yeah, and he was, he was in the tent with the rest of the, with his three friends, and uh, they just, I guess, he thought that somebody was joking around outside, but when he when they walked outside a matter of minutes um, they were gone but he found his jeep sitting right dead center on top of this big huge boulder <laughs> what's going so, so, so the sasquatch are practical jokers too they're practical jokers and basically were telling him don't come back 
to get out, but they weren't scaring him. They were just telling him. Like he, he was being respectful about it, not to bother them or you know try to find out who they are. Uh, I strongly feel that they were here before us, uh, that they were placed here, um, and to watch us. And uh, but interesting part, there's never been any First Nations persons ever had a conflict with uh, a a Sasquatch. They've always respected the Sasquatch for who it is, and they've always believed it was actually part of us, and by some by somehow uh, some way that it can communicate with us. Because mm -hmm. everybody, everybody was always respectful with the Sasquatch, and there was actually a West Coast uh, teaching about a Sasquatch that's here, and they actually have a song about the Sasquatch. Oh, really? Oh, under the Sasquatch, yeah. And there's actually. I, I wonder if that's. I, did, did, I was just going to say, I wonder if that's different from, uh, like you say, from from the West Coast versus uh, the center of North America here, because that, um, we, we have a. Uh, I was looking for some some of the historical cases, and in 1979, uh, there was a, a number of Sasquatch sightings uh, in um, up uh, Gypsumville uh, here in the uh, northern part of Manitoba, and uh, on some of the uh, reserves. And at one point, the chief I can't remember his name now, but uh, he got a, a, a group of uh, his friends together, and uh, they they got their shotguns. And rifles and we're uh, hunting this thing uh, to uh, try and kill it so is there is there a difference between the view of Sasquatch in the various uh, First Nations communities uh, across Canada or across North America like you say you were respected in uh, uh, on the West Coast why is it because uh, the Korean Ojibwe have a different view of them uh, perhaps I don't think so I think it's just that individuals thinking we have thinking. okay because I've never come across a Cree person or a Jibwe person saying, oh, the Sasquatch is deadly, you want to hunt it down and kill it. What's happened is um, there are people that are so, I guess you'd say, uh, government convinced that the Sasquatch is deadly, mm -hmm. uh, that it's a killer or that it will try to do harm. But right now, someone put a bounty on them. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah I, that's that. That's exactly why I was uh, I was called in recently because Spike TV uh, is offering ten million dollars for the capture or killing of a, of a Sasquatch. They have to remember now too: if you cap, if you try to capture or kill a Sasquatch, you're killing something of human sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should not put a bounty on something that has not done harm to you. And Spike TV should know better than that. Yeah, because it is it does have feelings. I mean, it, it can speak if it wants to. And I'm not talking about Harry and the Hendersons either. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's really unfortunate, but uh, you know I think uh, that's going to uh, cause some problems. You know where people are going to just want the money regardless of uh, the respect of of, of uh, animals and nature. There have been uh, I mean there's a couple of guys a couple of years ago um, they tried to fake up a, a Sasquatch and they had so it's so called they said they had it in the freezer and uh, they had, had bought it like the way it was built. Um, and then they found out later it was not real. Now there, there was a show uh, a couple of years ago, I'd say maybe about 10 years ago, this guy called in and said that he accidentally shot a Sasquatch and buried it. And uh, he called in on the radio show on uh, Coast to Coast, this is when Art Bell was on. Right, right. He told Art Bell that he really had a Sasquatch in hand. He told Art, like he said, he would call him up later on and tell him to come down and see the Sasquatch itself. Whatever happened after that, I have no idea. But I think what I understand is that um, Art preferred not to tell the story, whether it was actually that it's real or not, because if he did, the government or the military would come in and they would actually have it scooped up like we wouldn't believe it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, people make a big deal about it uh, because that guy was thinking, the, the fellow who did shoot the Sasquatch, um, at first he thought it was a bear and then he found it was a Sasquatch. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing is that he thought he would be arrested because of killing a human being. So right, right. Uh, he had to be real careful about it. But because of the story that was brought up on the show and him being a listener at the time, he felt pretty guilty about it. And I don't know what happened after that. I have no idea. But I know Art quit radio, so from there on, I have no idea. Well, well, well the, the news that came out oh, just, just, uh, just today is that Art Bell and uh, then 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 Ariel passed away after that. She. Uh, went into her depression after she passed away, and she passed away. 
Whoops. Like it was two ladies, one after the other. So Art and I never did make contact to be um, interviewed. It's mm -hmm. crazy how uh, the things, some, some of these things ever turn out. Uh, but, um, as far as Sasquatch is concerned, um, it's going to be an ongoing thing for the remaining of, I mean, the Sasquatch has been around for hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years. And um, if you ever decide to look under British Columbia stories of Sasquatch, you'd be surprised what you hear um, and read. Uh, they're they are very respected here. And I'm like, I mean, people are not really trying to find them. They accidentally come, come across them while they're camping. And because our forests, uh, our trees are so high, they're, they're, some of them are as high as 150, 200 feet. These are big cedar trees. So they're really, it's a dense bush. And uh, there's a lot of great camping areas because a lot of these areas are not specifically meant for vehicles to drive. You have to trek through the forest to create your own your own camping site. And there are times that you have to take your own rifle with you, um, you know, to basically make sure that you don't get attacked by a bear, so to speak. Um, but I've been known to, uh, uh, there's uh, my brother-in-law, my one brother-in-law said to me that when he worked for the gas plants, he uh, he actually would park on top of this hill. This is up in Alberta. He parked on top of this hill just before the going looking down towards the valley where the um, the gas plant is, and that's where he would he would go about a mile, mile and a half away, and he'd have his lunch. And so it was a really warm afternoon, a sunny day, and he had his window pulled down in his truck, and just himself. And he would normally every day would actually have his lunch, you know, pull out a sandwich and then eat it. Well, this one particular day, he uh, opened up his uh, lunch kit and he went to open up his have his sandwich and then he started smelling something before he started eating the sandwich. And something so, so strong and pungent, he said it stunk like a skunk, it was horrible. He said it was worse than the smell of a skunk because he's a farmer, or he used to be a farmer, so he knew was, knows what a real skunk smells like. They said this is worse than a skunk. It was so bad. So he looked at the where, 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 where's uh, uh, Tim Miley? Oh, yeah. yeah, where's Tim Miley in the alley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, we're gonna let Ted Chris go right now because he's being up for good knows how many hours right now, and uh, he needs some rest. Thanks, Chris, for coming on the show. Well, that's all we have time for tonight, guys. Uh, make sure to check out Jim, Doctor Dan Fitzsimmons, next on ZTalkRadio.com.